Welcome everyone to the opening reception for the exhibition called On the Bias. This exhibition uh, contains the artworks of members of the Fiber Art Network, which is a group of fiber artists across Western Canada and the Western North. And uh, it was founded in 19, 1999, yeah, not 1999. So we've been together as a group now for over 20 years, and we mount exhibitions of our work, and we send them off into the world to travel for three or four years at a time. So tonight's exhibit is the first uh, presentation of On the Bias. Judy will okay. speak about it tonight because she's giving us an overview of, of the exhibit itself. So other exhibit Ex exhibitions or exhibits at the Fiber Art Network um, have been in Edmonton recently and there's another one coming again next March to Stony Plain and that one is called Chromatopia and uh, information about all the fan exhibits are on the website fiberartnetwork.com. Tonight we'll hear from Judy Weiss. Judy's been a member since 2009 and she's been an active member. She organized an international um, exhibit that toured to uh, New Zealand and was shown in Canada as well in 2011. It was called Canadian Content and it was a very popular exhibit. She's also a member of the International Society of Experimental Artists. It's called IC, ICEA, and that group is having an exhibit, or sorry, a conference here in the fall. Judy will tell you about that. So she's a member of the Alberta Craft Council, which is headquartered here in Edmonton, and she belongs to a group of felters in the Edmonton Weavers Guild. Judy graduated with distinction from the University of Alberta, Faculty of Extension. She has a certificate of fine arts, and she's had work exhibited um, downtown at the Enterprise Square as part of her studies at Faculty of Extension, and also her work has been shown in the Alberta Foundation of the Arts, their traveling shows called Trex, T R E X, that travel to small communities in Alberta. She's had uh, many pieces in jury shows as well as in um, exhibits of the, of the Fiber Art Network. And without further ado, I just Turn the floor over to you, Judy Weeks. Okay. Thank you. Sharon has been say that we have been collaborators as well and have done installation work and have done charitable pieces for the Craft Council together. We've known each other quite a long time. And tonight she's going to be my Vanna White. And she's going to be holding up some of the quilts that are missing from the walls that you won't have seen yet as we go through the presentation. So I'd like to start and just make it really clear that I am not a judge of this show. This isn't a jury show. It's a member's show from Fiber Art Network. Um, my connection with the show is that I was supposed to have a piece in the show, and I was not able to fulfill that commitment because about a week before it was supposed to be delivered, my daughter-in-law went into premature labor oh. and delivered the baby the same day that I got that phone call. Oh. And... Um, I turned into grandma immediately, and I passed everything aside, went to babysit my two-year-old grandson, and I just never went back to the piece. <laughs> so I'm emotionally connected here by the fact that I wish I had been in this show, but that couldn't have been. So I'm not the judge, but the things that I'm going to show you give, me, give you my impressions of really great work. I couldn't put them all into the selections, but there's some really great work here. So, again, without further ado, um, I want to talk generally first about the exhibition itself. Um, what was presented to the artists as criteria for what they were going to do. Um, there are 48 works in this exhibition. There is one work permitted per person. And so 48 different artists, their challenge was to create, and this is a quote, uh, create a personal interpretation of the theme um, that bias can be negative or positive, conscious or subconscious, scientific or philosophical. 
Bias is may apply to society, politics, or to government, or to the environment, but they can also um, include interactions with family, friends, and neighbors. So some of you have heard me speak before, and I've talked to you about my belief that artists are a reflection of the contemporary society that they live in. But I tend not to think of it just strictly in terms of a reflection. I think of it as a prism. With all of the light that goes into the prism, the artist then processes it, breaks those lights apart into constituent colors and shapes and rhythms and thoughts that are particularly their own. So when an artist um, creates a work like this and is asked to put it through the filter of their own experience, you're going to see the tremendous variety of what comes out of that prism. And it's a really rewarding thing to see. Um, our artwork is personal to us, and in some ways the most powerful works are the ones that are also meaningful to other people. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. These works are personal, they're powerful, and they're expressive in that they come from the interior, from wherever it is that place is where your creative spirit lives. So given that they were all given um, three different criteria to work with, I've just read you the first one, it's pretty logical that there's a lot of different topics that are covered here. But the other thing that is a real factor is what are the backgrounds of the people and where do they come from that these become their important issues? And so out of the artist's bios, I just pulled some things that might interest you. The artists come from backgrounds in healthcare, in healthcare management, in nursing. We have a meteorologist among us. There's a firefighter. Um, there's an archeologist. There's specialists in accounting and mathematics. Um, people who are engaged in music or have had music as their careers. Some are small business owners. Some are into museum management and curation of garments that have been precious over the ages. Um, some come from farming backgrounds. Some are in the public sector. Um, some are into photography and digital design. Others are home economists, school teachers. We have garment makers and designers. People who have been sewing since they were like me from the time that I was 11. We have surface designers, which refers to um, whole cloth compositions that are done um, simply by manipulating materials and the, material, the cloth itself, so that it's one single unit that's been treated in a number of layers to produce a specific design. We have knitters and weavers, embroiderers, career artists, self-taught artists, mixed media artists, and people who are ranging in education from a BA to an MA to a BA to an MED, focusing somewhere in art to other people who have degrees in science and in business. So it's no surprise that all of these are so, so different on the same topic. Geographically, I think Sharon alluded to this before, um, these artists come from all the four Western provinces, and that's kind of easy to say, but when you really look at it, their personal environment ranges from the Great Northern Shield to people who live in coastal mountain areas and to wide open prairies. Some of them live in rural settings, and some of them are from urban settings, and it's up to you to guess which one matches which piece of work in the show because you'd never guess that some of the ones you'd think would come from a, a rural person actually come from someone who feels trapped in a city. So it's very interesting. Um, you'll see the variety as you walk through the show, but um, just for your own sake, take a look at the differences in the color palettes. See if you can see where those come from. Um, take a look at the techniques that are favored by individuals because those can also be influenced by the environment that they're in. So I'm going to start with the artworks, just two of the pieces first. The first one, um, the one in the greens and purples, is titled Light Will Triumph Over Darkness, and it's by Dale McEwen. I chose this one um, particularly for this category of, of um, sort of motivational, like what, what makes you think of your environment in terms of the theme. I chose it because of her abstract use of line in both direction of line, vertical and spread, and the quality of line that she's used. And it's a busy image, and yet there's a feeling of hope, 
arising from the kind of wine that she's used. And I felt that it was very effective for the, the use of the value contrast that's in it and the complementary color scheme of that, um, the yellow-green and the red-purple. And the second one is by Sharon herself, and, and she won't blush, I hope. Um, I chose this one uh, because of the theme. It's called titled Gender Bias. It's a very simple image that's peaceful and quite calming. And um, it's obviously realistic, but it's a dynamic composition for the use of line and for the realism that's portrayed there. It's very, very different from Dale's piece, which is extremely abstracted. Sharon has adapted this image from a Renaissance painting that you'll recognize by Leonardo da Vinci. It was painted in 1512, and it's titled The Creation of Adam, The Hand of God. And Sharon's translation of that image by changing the hand of males to the hand of females um, invokes a lot of questions. There are what if questions. What if that um, initial story had been changed? What if the nature of the story had been changed so that it was the hand of woman instead of the hand of man at creation? The use of the color pink is also really interesting to me because it symbolizes womanhood and it's a cliche in our society. And Sharon has used it to help make her statement. Um, the, the backdrop also reinforces for me how different the world might look if those two hands had been different. Okay, so the second prompt that was given to the artists, it was um, for textile artists, on the bias has a double meaning. It's a technical meaning, meaning when the fabric is cut on the bias, it is cut diagonally across the grain. So the warp and the weft fibers um, are at a 45 degree angle. It changes the drape of the garment, um, it changes how it hangs, it changes hemlines, it changes the comfort level of the garment. It's, it's quite an interesting concept. It has fluidity, it has flexibility, it has drapeability that it would not have if the garment was cut on the straight grain. Um, it tends to stretch and to sag if it's not handled correctly. And another aspect of it is that when you're working with fabrics and you cut them on the bias, the edges of the, the material don't fray the way that they would if it was cut on the straight grain. So seams and joins in the work can actually be left raw, lifted, combed, brushed, so that they're lifted up, and you gain a tremendous amount of texture in the work. Um, in all, in decorative work, the flexibility of the bias is used to create flowing lines and curves. So in this um, show, um, the bias became a play on words, and some of the artists used that to prompt political commentary or social commentary on the topic of women's issues. So these next two pieces, we'll talk about this one first. This is a takeoff on a designer, a French designer, who was born in 1876. Her name is Madame Vionnet. And uh, she literally invented the bias cut dress. She uh, was revolutionary in her time. She was well ahead of the curve in terms of women's issues. And in this piece, um, the dress that's been constructed here is actually cut on the bias, and it's, it's one of her designs. And the lady who actually constructed this piece has written in on the piece in handwritten text some of the revolutionary things that Madeleine did for women in society. And um, I'm going to let you just look at them, but they were things like introduction of daycare for women, they were paid maternity leave. These were unheard of in the early 20th century. And she was um, a women's advocate and provided every support that she could for women who were in the fashion industry. And at that time, we were talking about um, sweatshops. We were talking about the New York fire where women were barricaded into a building and were not permitted to leave and died in the, in the building fire as a result of it. And the conditions in that trade were absolutely horrendous. And Madeleine Vianney is one of the heroes of the women's movement. Another one that is really interesting in this is, um, it's of interest to me because of the graphic quality of it, but this also is a very um, female-oriented piece. When you see it from a distance, um, it's very eye-catching because of that ge geometric form that's a mirror image from top to bottom. It is actually physically cut 
um, the triangles that you see are all cut on the bias. They're very difficult to sew and to keep straight. And it's not my favorite technique in using anything like that in my sewing. I'm much more just do it. Um, but if you look up closely with this, you will see that in one of the panels, in the top panel, there are symbols there for female. You know, the circle with the cross below, and the, and the one below is the circle for the males. And so these are mirror images. And the artist has joined them in a really curious way. She has connected them with inseparable links. And I think that's part of her statement saying, male and female are joined at the hip and we have to learn to get together. But if you turn this piece upside down, one dominates over the other. And I think if you were to keep flipping and flipping and flipping this piece, you would, you would see a truer picture of, of uh, a balance in human relationships. So I just think it's a wonderful piece and just another one that you should have a close look at. I should also identify the artist. This is Bonita Rosander, and this one is Karen Johnson. So the third prompt that the artists were given is really an interesting one because it's kind of the balancing. Um, the prompt says, as humans and as artists, we're familiar with the concept of bias as being negative. It's a prejudice in favor of or against a certain thing, person, or group, usually in a way that's considered to be unfair. But we all have people, places, or things that we prefer. Positive bias is a part of the richness of life. So this piece I chose because it is one of those pieces that everyone I believe can relate to in human relationships. Some of us are half full people, you know, the glass half full. Some are the glass half empty. And when we consider biases, some of us respond with alarm, some with warning, some with reprimand, and some with condemnation. But others respond with hope and with solutions and with observations just about what life is really all about. Some are lighthearted and other ones are just practical, and some of them just want to live life without bias. Don't talk to me about it. So this piece um, is one where we were given as artists permission to express all that range of feelings. It didn't all have to be what was negative and what was awful happening in our society or in life. Um, this piece is called Opa Day by Angie Koch. It is about gender bias, but it's in a really witty, fun way. It's why a, grand, why a child prefers a grandpa over a grandma, sometimes. <laughs> I relate to that piece because um, my granddaughter loves my husband, and my grandson loves me. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, we really enjoy them, and I, I love that piece. This piece is by Marianne Parsons. Uh, she's out of the southern part of British Columbia, and it's called, of course, Women of Color. And this piece is a play on words, and it's about an unbias. It's the unbias that we have in making artwork, women's artwork, that is full of color. We don't care what color it is, we're going to use it. So um, my response was, knowing Marianne, um, she picks up all kinds of uh, discarded materials. She picks up clothing from dumpsters and takes trash out of other people's yards. <laughs> and she makes something of it, and they're always beautiful. And this is Marianne's way of saying, I just want to play in my own backyard. I'd like to address one more topic, and then I'll finish with the piece that engaged me the most out of the whole show. I want to address innovation in traditional textile methods for creating new surfaces. Um, there's an increasing crossover in fiber art with the fine arts and with mixed media, and there's a real blurred line now between art and craft, and it's being accepted on both sides of the art world. This piece particularly um, uses digital media and photo manipulation. So this piece is actually a digital collage. It's been put together by Marianne. She has um, adapted figures. She's adapted geometric shapes. Paulette. Or sorry, Paulette Cornish, yes. Um, it's called Women Leaping Into the Future. Um, she subtitled her work Down with Gender Bias Now. And the photographic manipulation, she uses digitally generated text, the photo collage, and it's digitally printed on whole cloth. 
So she personally has a large format printer and this can run through up to 17 inches and unlimited length. So she's producing this on a home printer, which is really phenomenal. Um, there are many organizations out there now, Spoonflower and a number of other companies, who are taking digital files from artists and printing directly onto fabric. And um, I am a big fan of it, having used those services before. And then you're free to add on top other layers of stitching, other layers of texture, other layers of plastics, and some people are using found objects on top of them. And so this to me was just a really good example of how people are delving into new things with old techniques. So the next one is another one of our smaller pieces. These, by the way, are arranged so that the smaller pieces are exactly half the size of the larger ones for the sake of shipping and for the sake of being actually able to hang them in a smaller space. This is called Darkness and Light by Jan Sprouts. I found this work to be particularly moving. It's a wonderful work from far away across the gallery because it's a high contrast piece, very strong diagonal lines. But it isn't until you get right up to the piece that you really begin to see how much she's actually done with the surface manipulation of it. She's used um, a digital photo transfer uh, to create images within the dark side of this piece. And she has also um, created lettering in different languages on the light piece that's on the top side of it. So if you notice, all of these messages of peace are written in, in a variety of languages. Um, the dark side of this piece, when you get up close, is actually full of very hopeful images. And I think that Jan has done that because she's saying, even in the darkness, there's still hope. And when you get up close to the piece, see if those emotions are evoked in you to see just where she's going with her ideas. Um, Jan's an embroiderer. You'll also notice that there's very small scale stitching. Some of the areas in this part of the work have been distressed. They've been actually removed from the, um, from the surface. So there are destructive processes that have gone into this piece of the well. And she's added layers of stitch in the areas where pieces of the wording has been removed. So if technically, this is a really interesting piece of work. It's complex, it has many layers in it, and it has many layers of meaning. So do take a look at this one. The next piece is called The Hidden Shame of Colonialism, and it's by Diana Bartholis. Diana's gonna be one of our speakers. She has a Zoom presentation coming up July 23rd. If you would like a link to her Zoom presentation, it's on deconstructed screen printing. That's a process that she has used in this piece. Again, I've chosen this piece because of its visual impact from a distance away, its bright colors, high contrast, strong graphic shapes, and it attracts the eye from a long ways away. When you look at this piece up close, um, Diana has actually made this um, as a response to the graves of the children that were found around the residential schools. And within the deconstructed screen printing, there are small crosses, each individually embroidered within the, the areas that represent the crosses. Um, Diana herself has an Aboriginal heritage, and this is very close and unique to her. And I just, it's one of the most moving works here because it's so meaningful. This, it's an example of a crossover between fiber and print media. It's an example of where the surface design is exceptional, but the nuances of the stitch that have been added into it are really chilling and they're very subtle and you, wouldn't, you really wouldn't even know they were there, just like the graves, if you hadn't gone looking for them. We come to the end of our pieces. And this one is my absolute favorite in the show. And you might laugh because we've seen some really great work already. But this is, this is my bias. I think every work should reflect the ideas and the, um, and the thought-provoking qualities of art coming from the artist's heart to your mind and your heart. So this piece is called Judgment Day. So what do you think that has to do with apples and bananas? <laughs> okay. 
Um, I, I just want to say, this one is also eye-catching from a distance, but you're not going to guess the meaning just from the distance. Up close, it's the relationship of the objects, the artistic tension between what's going on with the fruits and the bananas. Um, the, the, the title of Judgment Day tells you more about the tension, um, but it implies that it's a religious context, another biblical story. And I could see that kind of, yeah, because we've got one that's maybe judging the others. But then I started to look at it and I thought, who's judging who? Really, who's judging who? What's going on? And the bananas, I started to look, they're kind of aggressive. Those bananas are leaning over and it looks like they're giving that apple a really good talking to. So, is it about power struggles? I don't know. Is it about dominance? Is it about a threat of war? We've been talking about that a lot lately. Who's the aggressor there? And do we have one giant aggressor over one tiny little apple? I don't know. The apple's holding its ground. I think that apple, the symbolism of a circle, it's a closed, solid object, very strong. So, could it be about the environment? I'm looking at the shapes of fruit, and I'm looking at that table with a split right down the middle, and I'm thinking the green earth. What could that be all about? So, you see how I'm beginning to question? And then, I started looking even closer, and do you notice that all of those bananas are brown? They've all got blemishes and spots. And the apple, if you look down, there's a little shadowy area. Is that a bruise? What's going on there? There's a lot of ways that you can be looking at this piece. So is it bullying? Is it threatening? Is it jealousy? What's going on in the work? So I'd like to hear from you when you go up and examine that piece, what you think it's going because I'm sure I didn't hit them all. <laughs> okay, so I went looking for answers to what it was really about to the artist statement, and it was the perfect artist statement. It said, what do you see in this image? And that was all it said. What questions do you have? And I thought, that's good. She's not going to tell me what it is. I'm going to stand here and wonder for another 10 minutes. <laughs> so that artwork was the one that I engaged with the most out of the entire show. It took me the longest to try and figure it out. It's a beautiful piece. I would have it hanging in my home. But it made me wonder more than, more than any other piece here. So there may be another piece that strikes you the same way, and I'd love to hear about that. So I'm going to conclude now. The red, Sharon and I are going to put these back up, and you're going to be able to come around and look at them. But I have a couple of small things. Yvonne Villanueva, who's sitting right here, is giving a talk. The date and time of your talk is? The 19th from 2 to 3. Okay, on Tuesday. It will be right here in the same gallery. And you can find out how I burnt down, almost burnt down my house. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last thing is that I'm going to give you a shameless plug for the IC Symposium coming up, because I've been working on that now for almost a year. And um, there are a lot of sessions that are coming. It's an international symposium. There are sessions that are of interest to you as artists and as fiber people. There's a two-day workshop that's going to be on abstraction in quilting. And they're in fiber, actually. It's titled Abstraction Fiber. But there are also other things that will help you um, move further and further into abstraction if that's your area. Elaine Spafford is doing one on color and line that is really exciting. I'm signed up for that one at the moment. There's another one that is five half days, and it's on abstraction as well, but it's taking your thoughts and your ideas, I thought of you, Yvonne, um, because you asked me one time, what do you do with sketchbooks, and how do you turn those into finished work? And that whole class is about using your sketchbook, developing your ideas, creating a theme, and producing the work. It's the whole transition process. So there are some really great things for you to look at, um, there are workshops that you can try something that you've never tried before. You don't have to be at an expert level to be able to participate. It's just come, have a good time, meet other artists, network, and just enjoy each other. Enjoy learning. <laughs>